In the San Antonio suburb of Terrell Hills, Mary and Lewis Fisher grow awareness of the past that impacts the present and our future. Lewis, renowned for his books that tell the stories of old San Antonio, founded Maverick Publishing, named for Mary's family. Recently purchased by Trinity University Press, he published 45 books by 27 authors. Mary serves on the boards of the San Antonio Botanical Garden Society and the Brackenridge Park Conservancy. Born into the iconic Maverick family, her early home influenced her drought tough garden today. I grew up on Sunshine Ranch, which was then the northwest side of San Antonio. It's now within the, way within the city limits. But that was a, a family enclave, the Maverick family. My great grandparents lived there. It was just agarita and native grasses and mesquite trees and all those wonderful, just native things, sinesas. And it just kind of made an imprint on, I guess you'd call it my landscape of memory. And then when I was about 12, we moved into this neighborhood, Terrell Hills, which was a very different, kind of I'd call it a suburban landscape. And uh, very few, if any, mesquite trees. There were a lot of Arizona ashes at the time, which had been put in by developers. They're mostly gone now and uh, carpet grass, uh, aspidistra. When Mary and Lewis moved to Terrell Hills in 1973 to raise their sons, William and Maverick, it wasn't much different. But I still always had that in the back of my mind, the native plants, because I was passionate about that. About seven years ago, we added a rustic screen porch on the front of our house. Not that we're trying to be like the Joneses, but all the houses around us were being really torn down and enlarged. We did not want to do that, but we did want a little more space. We called John Grable, an architect here. Originally, a narrow cement stoop and utilitarian sidewalk fronted the house. It just didn't fit anymore with the front. So we took it out, and then I had always loved flags. I called them flagstones growing up. He said, well, let's do this. Let's do the stacked stones. As you walk down on the side, it, they did stack stones, and then we're gonna get these Oklahoma stones. They widen out at the front. We just took that opportunity, tarped the front yard, you know, killed the grass, the carpet grass, and then we just started making that change. And that's when I became a gardener. Mary started the transformation with San Antonio designers. In 2015, she hooked up with designer Scott Ogden of Plant Driven Design and Patrick Kerwin of Kerwin Horticultural Services. They broadened the scope with layers of native, regional, and well-adapted plants. New plants are still growing in, but there's never a static moment. Seasonally, rain lilies pop out in the buffalo grass, prairie-like lawn that's mown only a few times a year. And something that you really saw as a root weed before suddenly becomes you look at it with fresh eyes and you think, yes, rain lilies are pretty wonderful. In back, mature oak trees douse the garden in shade. Another heirloom is a majestic stone wall built in the 1930s around the former Letcher Brown estate. And it runs all the way up and down our street because the place encompassed an entire city block. And it has that patina of age that you can't duplicate that. Not so historic, but part of the family history is what's now a garden shed. Our boys were almost past the age of childhood. They didn't need a playhouse, but we did. Lewis and I loved it. Until their first makeover, though, the family didn't have a sturdy, charming patio to enjoy the view. And right behind the house, there was a little brick patio that the previous owner had hand installed. So it was real higgledy-piggledy. I think some of those bricks and others we combined and got a wall made out here and then got the Oklahoma stone put down. They added the perfect historic touch with old light fixtures from the Almost Dam. Mary rewired them to light the night on their own mini bridge. We put buffalo grass back there which gradually has been invaded by Bermuda grass and horse herb, which I kind of like the horse herb. So that has ended up being just uh, probably what you would see in the country. Sort of what wanted to be there has ended up there. And this is where really Scott Ogden came in because we hadn't had anybody much helping us back here trying to figure out what to do. In the raised patio bed, Scott chose plants to spill over. We weren't crazy after this wall was done. We felt like we wished we'd done stacked stone 
But Scott said, well, don't worry about it because you're not even gonna see that once the plants leave. Mary had created little stone pathways with leftover patio stones, but Scott and Patrick anchored secure footing, including a central walkway. And we walked on that side back all the time, so I made a little walkway over there, which Patrick came and kind of made it. Not like loving hands at home. Starting from the top, the first thing was to open up the tree canopies. That was one thing, when Scott came back here, the trees were much more dense. He said, it's completely dark in here, and you need to lift the trees up, get some more light in. He said, but then you've got a lot going down low, and you've got this up here, but you don't have that middle story. As Scott amended and added, he kept some of Mary's plantings, including the fragrant sweet olives her mother once grew. Certain things we, he just couldn't live with, and like Nandina. We had a lot of that and gradually we have removed it all. You know, it's an incremental process. Scott left the Nolinas, but he mixed in for a different kind of a texture, those palms. Scott and Patrick also built up the understory with progressively blooming small trees and shrubs. Balhinias extend blooming into late spring. They added edibles like figs and Myers lemon. But I had told him, I said, Scott, I really want that Maverick Mesquite. I just love it, that is my family name. Well, we didn't know where to put it because um, it has to have sun and we don't have much sun anywhere. And we settled on that spot because he said, well, the light will come in on those leaves. When the sun hits it, it's so pretty. And so I'm back to the mesquites that I grew up with and loved. It's like sort of coming full circle. It's a circle of multiple textures from grasses and flowering perennials to succulents, ground covers, and bulbs. You might ask me, well, what's your favorite plant? Or bloom? Well, it's the one that's blooming right then. And it's always something different. Although Scott efficiently sourced plants, many are ones you'd find growing in the wild or abandoned land. As water becomes even more precious, this garden's an important step forward back to the past people now don't have that rural connection. That my generation, we were all touched by the rural. And I feel like that's a real deficit. And that could be one reason why we're living in seas of carpet grass, because people weren't imprinted with the idea of these natives, these fabulous plants that are around us. But we think of them as weeds or useless or, you know, you just can go step by step. You don't have to do it right away. Maybe it's just nothing more than this year, don't put in the pansies, put in some sages or some butterfly bush or whatever. And once done, you will never look back because it's such a joy.